And welcome back to Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace. Uh, my name is Daniel Rogers, and I am joined today by Pastor Brian Zond of the Word of Life Church. Uh, Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Daniel. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm just delighted that you could uh, be on our podcast and agree to come on. And uh, we, a lot of the listeners and I have been reading one of your latest books. Well, I say latest, it's several years old, uh, called yeah. Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. And we'll get right. to that in a little bit. But um, in our circles, we don't really read outside of our tradition. You know, we're more encouraged to read yeah. people who uh, sort of, already believe the things that we believe and can confirm, except for debate books. We're big on debate books, except typically uh, we skip the speeches we disagree with and just read the responses. <laughs> so uh, a lot of our listeners may have never heard of uh, Brian Zond. And so why don't you take a few moments, uh, give us just a sort, short <clears throat> biographical sketch of you and your ministry, kind of what you're up to. Yeah, well, uh, as you mentioned, I'm the pastor of Word of Life Church here in St. Joseph, Missouri, the founding pastor. I've been leading this church for 41 years. <laughs> that's that's a long time. That's wow. a life's work. Uh, I come from the Jesus movement. And so I had a real dramatic encounter with Jesus when I was a teenager. And I was leading a ministry by the time I was 17, which is probably not typical. Yeah. that became Word of Life Church <clears throat> when I was 22 in uh, November of 1981. And so that's, you know, that's been the focus of what I do. I've also written, uh, how many have I written? 11 books, I guess, in the past like 13, 14 years. Uh, 10 of them are out. One of them is finished, but it won't be published until uh, next year. This will be a, an entire book on the cross, so you may be interested in that. Yeah. This book is going to be called The Wood Between the Worlds, A okay. Poetic Theology of the Cross. That's pretty and cool. And IVP yeah. will bring that out a, a year from now. So it's, you know, don't wait with bated breath. It's going to be a while. So <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm a pastor, author, and I travel quite a bit speaking. So that's that's my life. That's what I do. Cool. My wife and I have three adult uh, sons, they're all married. Our two older sons each have four children, so we have eight grandchildren. They live five minutes from us, so wow, that's, that's all a, wonderful. Yeah, that's a blessing. I, I saw a post today online that said the number one parenting hack is to live close to grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? <laughs> that's <laughs> absolutely true. It's, I know that's absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for us, my wife and I, we have uh, two children, uh, Caden, who is three, and Ellie Shea, who is four months old. And our parents both live an hour away each. And man, there are days when I wish they lived five minutes away. No, I'm a, serious. Sure. We're five minutes away. Yeah. Those two brothers live across the street from each other. Wow. So those eight sibling cousins are growing up as like a little clan that, <laughs> the zon clan on cob lane awesome. yeah they got their own <laughs> on baseball team and stuff <laughs> yeah yeah pretty that's, much yeah <laughs> that's fun um you mentioned uh the books you're you were writing the anticipated christ uh that's one that you've been preaching through uh in the last several weeks at word of life church i've listened to a lot of those sermons um tell us a little bit about that project you've been working well on. that is a advent Advent and Christmas devotion. Yeah. A few years ago, I brought out a Lenten devotion called The Unvarnished Jesus. And this is the Advent Christmas companion to that. It okay, takes yeah. the reader from, from the first Sunday of Advent all the way through Epiphany, which I think is 42 days. I think that's right. And what I did was I just preached the Sunday readings okay. throughout that time. But yeah, so it's a, it's a daily devotion for Advent and Christmas. That's pretty cool. That's that's the most recent book that's been published. We the Wood Between the Worlds, like I said, the manuscript is done, finished, accepted. Yeah. But, you know, you just got to get in line and wait for it to come out. Sure. Sure. They got to get the cover mm -hmm. art done and the right. you know, reviews Yeah, this book is going to have some artwork in it. Yeah. Um, even that's done as far as like what images and the permission to use them, all that's done, but you still have, we have to arrange them. I don't have to do much. I'm pretty much done. I just wait for it to come out and then talk about it a year from now. Hey, sounds good to me. I look But I'm to working it. on a 12th book. Uh, oh. Um, I've got my, uh, 
here's my here's my notebook for it that I have ideas that I'm writing in. It's this is going to be a memoir. Oh, that's great. I, I wrote a, I wrote a kind of memoir, a, a book that was sort of memoirish, I would say. Uh, Water to Wine that came out. I don't know what year that came out. Maybe 14, 15, something like that. Yeah. Oh, uh, this is going to be a, a bigger memoir. I'm going to call it with music in my ears. And it's really just my, my story as a as a pastor in America and, and kind that's, of the changes I've been through and that sort of thing. That's cool. I, I'm sure that'll be encouraging to a lot of the people who are in a similar situation to me where they're, where <clears> they're uh, pastoring a church and they're kind of learning who they are as they do this, uh, you know, hard work of ministering to people and yep. being able to read someone else's story and kind of, you know, walk, walk in their shoes, so to speak, mm -hmm. goes a long way in teaching. And I think, as you know, that's one reason why Jesus used parables all the time. There's such powerful ways to communicate uh, beautiful truths. Yeah. And I think, you know, if, if a story is compelling enough, people are interested in, in stories. So yeah. I'm going to tell some of my story. That's great. I look forward to reading that one too then. Uh, Brad Jerzak had already uh, advertised your book, Water to Wine, on this podcast a few months yeah. ago. And so maybe some people will... Uh, you know, Brad's that. one of my dearest friends. Yeah. Uh, we stay in constant communication. I mean, we text <laughs> constantly. I'm looking at my phone here. Yeah. When was the last text I got from Brad? Let's see here. Uh, it was, uh, at one Oh six P <laughs> it was oh, yeah, well, like, yeah. like a little more than a half an hour ago. That's awesome. So yeah. We, he, we, he... <laughs> we, we, we think of ourselves as sort of theological collaborators. We tend to bounce off of each other. I mean, um, this book, when everything's on fire, Brad wrote the forward to, he wrote a book that's kind of deals with a similar topic called out of the embers. And I wrote right. the forward for that one. So that's great. we're just partners in crime. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Uh, you know, I think everybody needs friends like that. Cause yeah. Um, yeah. As, as we, I think, as you've talked about, and as a lot of people have talked about, you know, the Bible needs to be understood in community. And mm -hmm. when we lock ourselves into an office and interpret scripture, often we are missing out on a lot of cool perspectives that our right. friends and family can offer us. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, that's why we bring on a wide variety of people onto this podcast. Uh, you know, I don't want to just talk about Church of Christ issues and interview Church of Christ ministers. I want to bring in people from a broad spectrum of the Christian faith. Every Everyone from people like Brad Jerzak uh, to yourself to I had a friend on a couple weeks ago to talk about the Tree of Life, who is a minister at the uh, Wall Street uh, Wall Street Church. She's uh, mm -hmm at the Episcopal church right there where Alexander Hamilton's gravesite is. And she came yeah. on to talk about the tree of life. So we have a, a wide well, range. What do you mean the tree of life? Well, that's what she was talking to us about. What we, She was uh, walking us through scripture about how that imagery of the tree of life is used from Genesis to Psalm one, to uh, the fruit of the spirit and all the way to the consummation in uh, revelation 21 and 22. Yeah, and, yeah, it's it's it shows up throughout scripture, and, and ultimately the cross is the tree of life. Exactly, but, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and that 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 was the ultimate point of the podcast, and she showed how Torah was looked at as uh, the tree of life, and then but the mm -hmm. ultimate expression of that, as I guess we're talking about all today, is is the cross of Jesus. Yeah. So you wrote this book, Sinners of the Hands, and a loving God instead of an angry God. Can you tell us right. about sort of the decision behind that title? Um, well, it, it was a, it was simply a sermon. Yeah. I'll, I'll back up here in a minute, but where the book actually came from was I just preached a kind of a one-off sermon. I thought it was a clever title yeah. playing off of Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. But my literary agent said, that should be your next book. And she was right. <laughs> I think it's the most popular book I've written. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah. And uh, so that's it started off as just a one-off sermon. But but uh, Andrea Heineke, my literary agent, she liked the title so much. She said, that should be your next book. So that's where that came from. Of course, I'm playing off of the 1741 sermon by the Puritan revivalist Jonathan Edwards, who, you know, I'll just for a moment here say some nice things about Jonathan Edwards. He was a keen intellect, had a great philosophical mind. Unfortunately, he was a Calvinist. Uh, 
sinners in the hands of an angry God, became far and away not only his most famous sermon, but arguably the most influential sermon in the history of America. Uh, He has a lot of stuff that's a lot better than that. Uh, because I think that sermon is basically atrocious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and yet, I I mean, I wasn't. I'm not just trying to pick a fight with, you know, a long dead Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> right. Rather, I mean, if if that um if that sermon hadn't had such a profound influence on the shaping of the American religious imagination, well, then I would have been happy to leave it alone. Uh, but that hasn't been the case. And just so people will understand. Early in my pastoral and preaching ministry, I was really fascinated by the great revivalists, Whitfield, Wesley, Charles Finney, these kinds of people, Dwight L. Moody. And then in that group, you would have Jonathan Edwards, who was the most prominent American. Uh, This is pre-revolution, but yeah, the prominent among the colonists in in the Great Awakening. Um, and so I tried to imbibe as much of their influence as possible. And I, I even created a little handmade version. I, I, what I did was I, I took a a larger work of Edward's sermons and I cut out, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God and put together my own little booklet of it. You know, as, I, as I say in the book, this is when cut and paste was done with scissors and glue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is not computer <laughs> stuff. Right? Yeah. And so, and so I made this. It had, you know, it had a blue cardstock copy uh, cover, and then I'd written in big black marker, "Sinners in the Hands of an," and then in all caps, "Angry." Yeah. Odd. Yeah. And then I had uh, parts of it highlighted with a pink highlight, and I memorized it. I mean, not the whole sermon, but passages I memorized so that I could use it in what I would now describe as evangelism by terrorism. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to grab my copy. Go for it. Yeah, that's awesome. This is my writing desk. You can't (laughs) see it, but it's just it's just piled with books. We love my own books. We love show and tell. Uh, This is great. (laughs) So uh, I'm going to give you just a, just a taste of sinners in the hands of I haven't looked at this for, well, when did this come out I'm curious I'm just 2017 I believe uh that's what it says yep uh and and of course though if it came out in 2017 I probably wrote it in I probably was writing it in 2015 you know right, so yeah. yeah um this is this is probably the most famous passage you know I don't know if this is still the case. Probably not. But when I was a kid, you would learn about this sermon in high school, generally in a creative writing course, Hmm. because for whatever reason, this became the stock example of descriptive writing. (laughs) All right. This this, this is – okay, this is a quote from – Edward's very famous 1741 sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. The God – that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider, or some loathsome insect over a fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath toward you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear you in his sight. You are 10,000 times so abominable in his eyes as the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. I got one more passage. That's the most famous one, the spider passage. This was my favorite, though. Was my favorite. It would be, he's talking, he's talking about the wrath of God. It would be dreadful to suffer this fierceness and wrath of Almighty God one moment, but you must suffer it to all eternity. There will be no end to his exquisite, to this exquisite. Horrible misery, 
When you look forward, you shall see a long forever, a boundless duration before you, which will swallow up your thoughts and amaze your soul, and you will absolutely despair of ever having any deliverance, any end, any mitigation, any rest at all. You will know certainly that you must wear out long ages, millions of millions of ages, in wrestling and conflicting with this almighty, merciless vengeance. And when you have so done, when so many ages have actually been spent by you in this manner, you will know that all is but a point to what remains. Wow. That that line, though, um, where did it go? Almighty, merciless vengeance. Almighty, merciless vengeance. And, and talking about God. Now, I understand. Believe me, I mean, I'm coming from one. I'm coming from one who advocated that kind of theology for many years, preached it. Right. Uh, uh, so I know how to paint a picture of God as one who engages in almighty, merciless vengeance by using select texts of Scripture. I know how to do that. Right. The question remains, is it true? Is that actually... I mean, is God actually angry, violent, retributive. I know how to paint a picture. I, I, can, I can paint that portrait of God using selected text, but is it true? And I just, I eventually came to the, I mean, you might guess because I wrote a book <laughs> called Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, that right. that is an inaccurate portrayal of the God who is perfectly revealed in Jesus Christ. So that's wow. kind of what this book is about. Yeah, and w when you think about that, expression merciless you know that's the very yeah. opposite of, of how most people pray i mean even people that would buy into that kind of theology they would say uh, oh heavenly merci merciful father you know right. or great we use terms like graceful merciful loving but to say merciless i mean that just seems to <laughs> go against everything well it certainly yeah um contradicts what we see in jesus christ yeah right and, and so that's really at the heart of this, what is the ultimate revelation of God? Jesus Christ alone is perfect theology. Wow. Yeah. It's like what the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter one, right? Where the writer yeah. says that he is the exact representation of God. I mean, that is just that yeah. right that right there is good news, I think. It is good news. <laughs> yeah. It is good news. <laughs> so when we think about when we think about the cross, let me kind of walk you through uh sort of how, how I approached the cross for a long time. That mm -hmm. line that you said there about uh, the spider and being dangled over the fire, mm -hmm. my thought was, is we are deserving of that kind of punishment. And the only way that God can satisfy, satisfy both his justiceness and his holiness is by basically doing that exact thing to Jesus, you know, there on the cross, punishing him and laying all of our sins on him and, and yeah. punishing him instead of us. The, the problem that I ran into was we were singing a song one day that said, uh, and on the cross when Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Now, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't raised Calvinist. So when I heard that line, the wrath of God was satisfied, I thought, wait a minute. Don't I believe in future wrath? So if I sing the wrath of God has been satisfied, and yet I believe that there is a future time of wrath, then how could it be satisfied? Well, it must only be satisfied for a limited number of people. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. If it, that doesn't make sense, because, you know, first John says that it's for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. So that doesn't make yeah. any sense. Well, if it's only for a limited number you're, of you're, people, you're plucking the L off the uh, tulip there, brother. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so as you keep going down that path, though, you end up with tulip, you end up with Calvinism. And so I thought, yeah. well, I don't buy that. So right. does that mean that I really buy this other thing about God's wrath being satisfied on the cross. And that's kind of what started me on this journey uh, towards questioning something I just assumed was the only way to look at the cross. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call penal substitutionary atonement. Is that theory? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I always add the theory. It's penal substitutionary yeah. atonement theory. I know it's a mouthful, but right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's funny because, uh, yeah, I told you I come from a more fundamentalist background. So we would always do that with evolution. Theory of evolution. See, theory. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, <laughs> so, oh, you always have to put a capital T on the theory. Yeah. So uh, is that kind of your uh, sort of similar experience? How did you go from 
literally preaching Jonathan Edwards to <clears throat> preaching Jesus. <laughs> uh, well, we can. There's a, there's so much to talk about here. Sure. Um, and we'll get into it. I assume. Sure. So, but how it really happened with me was is fairly recent. Uh, let, let me let me let me just set this. Let me set it up by saying, sure. penal substitutionary atonement theory is very prominent in the Western Church, especially among any of the Reformed influenced uh, denominations. Right. But it's relatively new. You trace its origin of. Probably back to Anselm a thousand years ago. We can talk about that here in a minute if you like. But it really comes into its current form under Calvin, so 500 years ago. Uh, the the entire Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, has never thought about uh, how the cross saves us in that way. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, I was writing a book. One of my It was my second book. I think it came out in 2010, 11, something like that. I can't remember. It's called Unconditional, uh, or, well, they gave it a second title for the paperback. The paperback, which they shouldn't have done, but it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. The paperback's called Radical Forgiveness, and so it, it's a book on forgiveness. And I was writing that book, and I began to have some theological questions. I said, well, does God actually forgive us, or is God the recipient of a payment and how does that work oh yeah and yeah. and and the longer i meditated on this the more absurd the claims of penal substitutionary atonement theory began to appear and right. so that's what put me and then i began to have a lot of conversations with my theologian friend bradley jerzak who we've already mentioned and um and that's and that's why I just I just moved away from that. It, but a, a lot of people don't know that there are for most people in certain denominations in the Western Protestant Reformed influenced church, penal substitutionary atonement theory is simply to them the gospel. Right. And so if you say no, that isn't how we talk or speak. That that isn't a proper metaphor for understanding the cross. People almost hear it as well, you're denying the cross. I'm not denying the cross. Right. Uh, I'm just trying to find a more accurate, more truthful way of talking about what happens at the cross than what Anselm and then even in a more egregious manner, Calvin uh, imagined it. They imagined the cross as where Jesus saves us from God. Uh, no. The cross is not what God inflicts upon Jesus in order to forgive. The cross is what God in Christ endures as he forgives. At the cross, Jesus does not save us from God. At the cross, Jesus reveals God as Savior. One of the most uh, significant theological problems with PSA theory, see I've abbreviated it now, there we go, yeah. is, uh, is that it, it, it does <laughs> violence. Yeah. To the triune nature of God, it pits the Father against the Son. And so the Father must be satisfied, as if the Father, somebody has to be killed, not only killed, but tortured. Someone has to be tortured and killed. It has to be an innocent one. That's the way that it works. But it really turns God into a monstrous, vengeful deity, or, because people push back on that, and they say, well, no, 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 justice has to be satisfied. Oh, really? So is it like this? God is saying, look, guys, I'd love to forgive you, but I got to satisfy justice. To which then I want to say, well, who's in charge here? Yeah. Well, <laughs> do, do I need to talk to your manager, God? Is that is that it? Because right. you are you are subordinate to well, justice? And how, and how does the torture and death torture and murder of an innocent one what this justice sounds whack to me now i don't i know people don't like it when i'm that snarky about it sure um because they because they've come to hear this as the gospel and it's not and it's not it's just it's just not yes christ died for our sins but we send our sins into jesus the cross becomes the place where the sin of the world 
coalesces into a hideous singularity and with great violence is sinned into the body of the Son of God. But what does the Son of God do? The Son of God responds saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Wow. And here's the thing, especially in John's gospel, but all of Scripture. Jesus never acts as an agent of change upon the Father. I mean, good, solid, orthodox, classical theology states that God is immutable. Right, yeah. God doesn't mutate. God is not subject to change. In fact, if God is subject to change, then look out, the ground beneath our feet is moving and nothing is sure. <laughs> so, no, the, the Son is not changing the Father. The, ch the Son is revealing the Father. Think in John's Gospel, how many times Jesus says something like, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what the Father says. The Father and I are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, the response is, of course, son, that's right. who we are. That's what we do. So one of the many problems with PSA, besides, I mean, I've already mentioned that it subordinates God to a sort of a, a certain concept of judgment, kind of retributive justice as judgment. And it pits, and then it, it pits the Father, and it does violence to the Trinity, and it gives us a very distorted image of God. And then you already alluded to it. You, you said, and this, this, is, this is accepted as a truism throughout so much of the church world in the West, that Jesus endured on the cross what we all deserve. Yeah. And that, that is so common, people just kind of like the little bobbleheaded things, you know, and they just right. nod their heads. No. I mean, I'm okay. Let's let's think about. Um, let me pick one. Let's think. Let's let's think about my seven-year-old granddaughter, Hope. You had eight choices, and you picked Hope. I I know because I, <laughs> I I was going through the names of Hope. That's a good one. Oh, there we go. And um, <laughs> does she deserve to be tortured and nailed to a tree until? Does she deserve that? Now, it, it, is she sinless? No, but. Are, are, come on, are you going to look me in the eye? Right. I know a Calvinist will, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it, it shows you part of the problem with this theology. You, yeah. You're going to tell me she deserves that? No one deserves that. No one. No one deserves that. So what we have is we have this idea that it's like this. God says, all right, I'll forgive, but I got to get paid. Yeah. And so I want, I want, uh, I want a death. Okay, can Jesus just uh, live out a life and die peacefully in a bed? No, 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 no. I want. Uh, it's going to be violent. I want uh, crucifixion because that one's awful. I want that. Oh, oh, cursed, cursed is the oh, one who's look, on a tree. You know, <laughs> I, I want, I want some thorns. Yeah. I want, a, I want a crown of thorns. Well, how, how many? How many? How many thorns? Ten be enough? No, I don't think so. We need more than that. So it's, you just keep going and going. Oh, wait a minute. I want him scourged. Uh, he's got to be scourged first. Scourged, then thorns, then nails, and hung there until dead. Now, if, if you make this point like this, people kind of back on and say, well, you yeah. know, some of this was some of this was gratuitous violence inflicted by human beings. And I'm going to go, well, explain how this division of labor works. <laughs> right yeah between you know no in, in the in the book of acts what you find constantly is the apostolic preaching says you or we murdered the son of god but god raised him from the dead uh, the violence resulting in death that jesus endured on the cross was inflicted by human hands not by divine will now some will say yeah but but god knew that his son would would end up crucified well so did plato plato <clears throat> in the republic is having this conversation with his brother in, in these in this dialogue yeah and his brother begins to to wonder ponder what would happen if a perfectly just man came among us came to Athens in the 4th century. 
BC, although they didn't call it BC back then. <laughs> well, they had to change their checks, you know, from BC <laughs> to AD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if they had like a Y2K moment there. Or something. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. yeah they're... What's what the would happen if, they, were... <laughs> if a perfectly just man came among us and they oh, said, man. we would reject him, spit upon him, scourge him, and after all manner of torture, we would crucify him. Wow. That's, actually, that's actually in Plato's Republic. And so that the father knew that the son would suffer at the hands of sinful men by his mere presence. As Rene Girard says, violence cannot tolerate the presence of one who owes it nothing. Yeah. That the father knew this would happen does not mean this is what the father required on his behalf in order to forgive. Rather, it simply becomes, it becomes many things, but it's the point at which, uh, as I mentioned, sin coalesces into a hideous singularity that it might be forgiven in mass. It's also the entry point at which Christ goes down into death in order that through death he might defeat death and liberate the captives of death, that, that he makes... He leads captivity captive, that that the captives of death, which is the human race, uh, now becomes the spoils of Christ's victory. And those captives become his captives as he leads them out into salvation. So I don't know. I'm just I'm just doing my thing right now. So you need you need to intervene here, Daniel, and sure, get yeah, me on yeah. track and <laughs> no, no, ask you're doing what great. you want to ask me. Oh, no, it's awesome. I love hearing it. It's, it's wonderful. Um Going back to this idea of forgiveness, and this is one thing that tripped me up too when I really started to think about it critically, is how could it be forgiveness if a payment is demanded? Right. If the judge, if you owed, you know, a thousand dollars to the state or whatever, and I went and paid it off, you know, the judge says, uh, "Okay, now I forgive you." Well, <laughs> no, I didn't. The judge didn't forgive you of that amount. I paid it off exactly. Right. And so, so yeah. So saying that Jesus paid for our sins, but also saying that our sins have been forgiven seems to be a bit of a paradox uh, to me. Well, yeah, now I'll get to that in a second. Now, there is economic metaphor language in the scriptures, sure, particularly sure. ransom. Right, Mark. But yeah. this, this is, now this is going to freak people out, but I know what I'm talking about. The church fathers, when talking about the ransom, they, they say that Christ became a ransom for us. Right. But here's the thing. And they, it's clear in all of their sermons, the ransom is not paid to God. The ransom, because it wasn't God that held us captive. The ransom is paid to death, or sometimes that's more personified as the devil. And right. so they would talk about um, that there was a kind of trick that was played upon the devil yeah. or death and or death. So that... They, they use language like this. They said that um, the humanity of Christ was the bait upon the hook of divinity. And so Christ could die because he was fully human. He was mortal. Right. But death cannot digest divinity. So that when, when Christ is given as a ransom unto death, it was a ransom that death should never have taken because as Christ descends into the realm of the dead, he does so as very God of very God, true God of true God, and death is destroyed from the inside out. Wow. So ransom language is in the scriptures. and But in interpreting it, the first Christian theologians, the church fathers, said they never said the ransom is paid to God. The ransom is paid to death and to the devil. Okay, so uh, another thing, about though, about payment, the... the, the uh, parable of the prodigal son has often been described as the gospel within the gospel. Yeah. You know, there's a reason it's the most beloved of parables, but if you have PSA atonement theory lurking in your stew of theological ideas, you have to have this ugly insertion. And so while the son, the prodigal son was a long way off, the father saw him, he felt compassion and he ran to the servants' quarters, where he beat the daylights out of a oh man, yeah, out of a out of a whipping boy. 
He beat he beats this whipping boy until until his wrath is satisfied, and then he can go and embrace his wayward son finding his way home. No, yeah, we forget about that part. Yeah. There there is no pain. What was squandered, you know, the the father's inheritance squandered in the in the in the far country is just lost. Right. There's no payment. No, nobody gets paid back. The father's not paid back. No one's paid back. And what what amounts to justice is reconciliation within the family. Now, I understand that people think that's not fair. That's the whole point of the parable. The yeah. elder son doesn't think it's fair. He's, say, he's <laughs> saying justice isn't satisfied here. Right. Justice is not being satisfied. And how does the parable end? It ends with the elder brother. Let, let's imagine it this way. You know, the son has come home, robe, ring, shoes, fatted calf, party going on, music, dancing. Now it's nighttime. But the son won't come. The older son, the brother, won't come to the party. So he's in the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing his teeth in anger and, anger and resentment. And the, and the father goes out to the other son right. in the outer darkness and pleads with him to accept forgiveness as justice and come to the party. And then it, we don't know how it ends. Because it's up, it's up now to the <laughs> elder brother to decide what he's going to do. So those that find themselves saying no, there has to be some, someone has to die, someone has to be killed, someone has to suffer for there to be justice. Well, you're going to find yourself in bad company because that's not the prodigal father. Prodigal actually means excessive, and the, the you know Tim Keller wrote a nice book on that. The prodigal God, how yeah. how how God is extravagant, prodigal, you know, squanders His love and grace right upon all who will receive it. Yeah, you know some. Uh, no, no, notice how in making a case against PSA, I just quoted a reformed pastor. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> A very beloved reform pastor too. Yeah, um, exactly. So when you talk about this idea of, of forgiveness and, and a payment, I think about the parable in Matthew 18. You have this king who has this servant who owes 10,000 talents. Mm -hmm. And when he's going to go to punish him, the man asks for forgiveness and he says, okay, you're forgiven. <laughs> you know, you're just forgiven. There's no payment that's ever made. There's no, right. uh, somebody else doesn't pay him off. The king just forgives him outright. And I think, you know, when we read the parables, we sometimes apply this sort of uh, interpretive tool, I suppose. We say, well, if the unjust judge could do that, or if the king could do that, or if the prodigal father could do that, then how much more is the God of heaven and earth able to do that as well, right? Right. And the part about 10,000 talents that stands out to me is that that's the amount that was paid in the book of Esther, Mm -hmm. to uh to sign off on on the genocide of all the jews and so when you talk about what can god forgive can god really forgive something like genocide without a pain well apparently so because of the parable of the talents he forgave ten thousand yeah. ten thousand talents there uh, for I, I talk about that quite a bit in the, that book that i mentioned earlier radical forgiveness yeah or unconditional if you want the hardback <laughs> right yeah they should not have changed the name but anyway uh i talk a lot about about forgiveness in the light of the Holocaust. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's tough. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of things I want to say about that, but uh, we'll save it for another time. Um, so getting back to this idea of forgiveness, we have this line from Hebrews. It's often quoted. And I think Michael Brown may have quoted this to you in the monster God debate uh, where he says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And yet here is Jesus before the cross for three and a half years. Uh, uh, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Hey, your sins are forgiven because of their faith. You know, uh, forgiving sins before the cross over and over and over again without ever having a sacrifice made or asking them to go to the temple. In fact, I think one of the only times where he tells them to go to the temple is in the case of uh, exclusion from the community with leprosy. Go and present yourself to the priest, right? Uh, but he never asks anybody to make a sacrifice. He just forgives them right then and there on the basis of their faith. Uh, so I always thought, how was that possible? Was it done in, was it done in a prospect, you know, anticipating the cross? Um, or was that just a revelation right. of who God is? God is a God of forgiveness. Yeah, I think it's the latter. Uh, yeah. the, the, the famous text um, 
it, it gets, we always quote a fragment of it. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But the, the entire verse, it's Hebrews 9, 22, indeed under the law, almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Right. But that's just setting up an argument that'll spill over into chapter 10, yeah. where the writer of Hebrews is now quoting from Psalm 40, sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sin offerings you take no pleasure. So th this raises this very interesting question. Does God require ritual blood sacrifice? Um, and, you, and we'll start with the Old Testament. And... Uh, you don't get a univocal answer right. from the Old Testament. You get a multivocal response. If we ask the Old Testament, does God require ritual blood sacrifice? If you ask the Torah, if you ask the priests, I suppose if you ask the Levites, the answer is going to be yes. And I can show you the texts in Leviticus where it says God requires daily blood sacrifices yeah. for the remission of sins, for forgiveness. But then later, and we're talking about over the course of a thousand years, this begins to be questioned by the psalmists and the prophets. So, for example, as the writer of Hebrews does, quoting Psalm 40, the, the psalmist says, burnt offering and blood sacrifice you have not required. You've opened my ears. I, I get this now. And then you have Hosea who speaks in the name of Yahweh and says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And that, in fact, is a verse that Jesus quotes twice. Yeah. <laughs> twice he quotes that to the Pharisees. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And by sacrifice, we mean ritual blood sacrifice. There is a sense in which, of course, we're, Jesus sacrificed. He lays down his life for us. He dies for us. He enters into our death that he might liber liberate the human race from death. And then we, too, take up our cross, and we follow, and we present our bodies a living sacrifice. So, the, so sacrifice is involved. And so in my critique of penal substitutionary atonement theory, it isn't even substitution and certainly not sacrifice that I'm opposed to. It's the idea of how penal is applied, that it means that God essentially had to kill his son in order to forgive us. Right. And, and, I, and I love how I you're... mean, to, to make it very blunt, that all, that in, in the PSA system, ultimately, the one that kills Jesus is God. It, it's done through other instruments. You know, we, we have Judas involved and we have Pilate involved and Roman soldiers and all of that. But ultimately, it is God who kills Jesus in that system, and that's just not true. That's just not true. In fact, one passage that's often quoted to justify PSA theory is uh, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you just read to the end of the chapter, right. and the answer is, yeah. I haven't forsaken you. <laughs> that's a, that, no, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, as you keep going— Right. The psalmist then talks about how God hears when we cry out to him. Jesus certainly, I mean, he starts that psalm, and he certainly he certainly enters into that existential experience of God forsakenness. Right. He did not I mean, despise. I would, I would say it this way. Yeah. Jesus was forsaken by God as you and I have been forsaken by God, which means we haven't, but we have experienced it as such. Well, like Isaiah 53, we esteemed him, right, smitten of God and afflicted. Not that he was, right. is that that's how we viewed it. Just like, the, just like the Pharisees viewed the man that was born blind from birth as smitten of God because of his family sins. That's how we look at Jesus uh, in this, in this uh, theory as smitten of God and afflicted. But yes, and not... I might as well head somebody off at the past since we're talking about uh, Isaiah 53 because inevitably, right? I mean, as sure as the sun rises in the east, somebody is going to bring up Isaiah 53.10 which in the NRSV is translated, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain when you make his, his life an offering for sin. Um, a couple of things about that. W what you have in Isaiah 53 is you have clearly an innocent one 
that is suffering that we esteemed as you know cursed of god smitten and afflicted but but he was it was our sins that were being sent into him but then you get to isaiah 53 10 it was the will of the lord to crush him and that gets thrown up all the time in atonement debates and i say two things about that one i don't think you get to use old testament verses in new testament atonement theory if they're not quoted in the new testament uh, Isaiah 53 is quoted repeatedly throughout the New Testament, various passages over and over, but not this verse. This verse never shows up in the New Testament. Also, remember this, it is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that is always quoted in the New Testament, always. They're not quoting from the Hebrew, they're quoting from the Greek translation, and so if they were to quote Isaiah 53, 10 in the New Testament, it would read this, the Lord is willing to cleanse him from his injury. <laughs> <laughs> Pleased to crush him gets turned into, in the Septuagint, the Lord was willing to cleanse him from his injury, which actually flows nicely with New Testament uh, cross theology because, you know, the, it's the father that raises him from the dead. We did the killing, God did the raising of the dead. So I know a lot of people are thinking then, and you've touched on this a little bit already. Uh, you said it a couple of times. How do we then understand that language? Like when we're taking communion and someone prays, uh, you know, thank you for this cup, which represents the blood of Christ, which was shed for right. many for the forgiveness of sins. H how does your mind read that passage? A couple of things. First sure. of all, um, we need to understand the Hebrew concept of sacrifice. We are so far removed from actual sacrificing right. that we don't have a connection, certainly with the Hebrew understanding of it. What we tend to have a connection with is a pagan understanding of sacrifice. Take for And of course, the, the central motif for blood and redemption and liberation that's the Exodus story. That's the Passover. That's the Passover lamb. That's the blood on the doorpost and lintel. Remember that the Passover lamb is not being punished. The Passover lamb provides the meal to establish the covenant between God and his people, a covenant that results in liberation. So the, the lamb is brought into the household until the 14th of Nisan. And then it is sacrificed to provide the meal. It's not tortured. <laughs> I mean, you read Exodus. They don't, they don't tell you, you know, now tor get, get yourself a little crown of thorns and put it on the little lamb's head and, right. and you know, beat the lamb up for a while and then, and then nail it to a tree and let it die really slow. No, I mean, it's the, the, the lamb is dispatched uh, humanely and swiftly. Because what we're interested in is the providing of the meal, the essential meal. So that's part of what's going on there. Also, it is the moment that Jesus speaks that saving word of forgiveness, that, that, that Matthew, uh, Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, as he bleeds, as he dies, as he suffers. But where does the violence come from? Not from the hand of God, but from the hand of man. And so in his own blood, he is speaking this word of forgiveness. And so and when we talk about blood and, and speaking, and okay, that draws us to Abel. And so Cain is killed, kills his brother Abel, and God knows because his blood cries out from the ground. And it seems to be crying out for some sort of vengeance because there is a kind of punishment bestowed upon uh, Cain. Uh, the mark upon Cain is actually a mark of mercy that you cannot uh, take vengeance on him. Right. But he is he is made in exile, and so he is he is sent away. He's exiled, and so it, it's the blood of Abel speaks a word that leads to exile. The blood of Jesus, as the writer of Hebrews says, speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the blood that brings us home. This is the blood of the new covenant. This is the blood where we say it, that 
that the sin of the world has been forgiven for. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, not the sins, but the sin. The, the, the sin as a single thing of the world is taken away in that moment. So I have absolutely no problem talking about the blood of Jesus. One of the problems with PSA, and as you can guess, I think the problems are legion, um, is that even if PSA were an accurate way of talking about what happens on Good Friday, and I don't think it is, um, and and I'm not alone. I'm not some sort of like freakish outlier, by the way. I just want to yeah. stress that. <laughs> right. But again, the entire eastern half of Christianity has never embraced this. And when they hear of it are appalled by it, and they say, no, that is not what's happening at the cross. So it isn't like I'm some sort of – it isn't like this is a progressive position. It is like this is actually the real conservative position. Someone uh, – I think Brad Jerzak in his book, A More Christ-like Word, uh, he was quoting someone else, and he said, oh, I know your problem. Your problem is you're not serving uh, Jesus as Abba. Uh, you're talking about Molech. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It's exactly right. So – um. Mm, where was it? oh here's here's one of the problems right that even if it were a correct model for atonement and i do not believe it is it has this problem in that it becomes the only way that people talk about the cross and so it becomes the only thing there's there's no concept of the cross also shames the principalities and powers right the cross is also where death is defeated the cross is where we also find the abolition of war the cross is and you can go on and on and on with psa it's like yeah, that's what it is. I'm done with. It. I don't have to. I don't have to think about it anymore. Yeah, it's it's no, a the, the, it's a transaction instead of this eschatological event that ushers in this new creation. You know. Well I, said. Well yeah. said, Daniel. Yeah, I agree. Wow. Okay. Let's see. So we've <laughs> there's so much <laughs> there's so much to talk about. So we have a little bit of uh, we've talked about Isaiah 53. We've touched on Hebrews 9. Oh, here's another one that I've heard a lot of people bring up um, when we're talking about this idea of is God as a as a violent God, is God a God of vengeance? And we can get to Revelation in a second. But oh, so Second Thessalonians one, it's one of Paul's first letters, maybe his second or third letter, depending on how you date Galatians. Right. And he says, and this really gets people to come down the aisle for the altar call. Uh, that Jesus is going to rebuild, rebuild from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that, you know, know not God and know not the gospel. How, when you read that passage, um, what, what comes uh, well, to your mind? There, there, I, have, I have different ways of responding to that. Sure. I will say it's, you're right, it is early Pauline. Yeah. And, uh, but I don't, I don't, I, I'm not opposed to the idea of the wrath of God. Right. And that, and that sin is punished. The question is, is it purely punitive or is it therapeutic? Right. I mean, what to what end is sin punished? I, I'm not opposed to talking about the wrath of God. In fact, I'll get to that in a second. But this book, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, I don't ever say this anywhere in the book. I, I don't. But I'm going to tell you the structure of the book. It's this. So I'd already written a number of books where I'm presenting God as uh, nonviolent, love, merciful. And, and I know there's people that are like, I, I hear that. I resonate with that. Yeah. But what about right, exactly. the Bible? Yeah. And it's really, it's, it's what about Old Testament violence? What about the wrath of God? What about the violence of the cross? What about hell? What about the book of Revelation? And that's this book is my answer to sincere questions, not gotcha questions, but sincere questions yeah, of sure. what about. And and I knew this book would be well received among everyone that didn't have like a formal, official, diehard commitment to Calvinism. I knew that that kind of breed of Calvinist, you know, the 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 young Calvinist Theo bros. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I knew I, I knew they wouldn't like this book, and they didn't, but I didn't yeah. expect them to. Everyone else has pretty much really liked this book, even if they don't agree with it all. They're like, oh, this is good things to think about. Sure, yeah. And so the wrath of God is the love of God wrongly received. God has a single disposition towards his creation, and that is one of unending, unconditional, unalterable, unvariable love. But how we, how we experience it depends on how we respond to it. Right. So, for example, in... In uh, Romans, 
at the end of chapter 12, Paul is kind of riffing on, apparently he was aware of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount isn't in the, the Gospels aren't written when Paul writes Romans, but but he's aware of some of what Jesus taught, apparently. And he's basically saying, you know, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If it's thirsty, give him drink, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Love your enemies. For in so doing, you will pile hot coals upon their head. Yeah. Which is a quotation from Proverbs. Now, Paul is not teaching us how to torment our enemies. That's that's antithetical to the very point he's making. Rather, he's saying that will be the experience until they learn to accept love as love. So, yeah. for example, if I decide, you know, I just I just can't stand this Rod Tucker guy, you know, and his church and what he does and all that he stands for and his stupid podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and I just I just, you know, I just become a, like a really I just, you know, become a real enemy. But then one day, you know, but then my life begins to fall apart and I disintegrate. And someday you find me homeless, a homeless vagabond on the streets of North Alabama. And you take me into your home. Yeah. And you you give me food, you give me drink, you treat me with kindness, you provide me with what I need. Now, now I have a choice. You you are simply acting out of love. If if I hold on to my hatred, your acts of kindness are actually going to be a source of torture to me. Yeah. But if but if I will surrender that hate and go, what's wrong with me? This yeah. Rod Tucker guy's awesome. And, and what and what was torture me just turns into a wonderful shared meal of fellowship. Yeah. So the wrath of God is what happens when we go against the grain of love. All, all creation comes from the God who is love. Why does God, I mean, we know that, why is there something instead of nothing? Because in the beginning, God said, let there be. But why does God do this? And however you try to answer it. You know, and you can do very sophisticated things with like the theology of Sergei Bolkakov, but you end up ultimately saying, because God is love, love seeking expression. Yeah. And and God cannot not create because God must love. And so this this establishes a grain to the universe, the grain of love. And if we go with the grain of the universe, it tends towards well-being. It doesn't mean nothing bad will ever happen because freedom allows for all kinds of vagaries, and, and we understand that. But it tends toward well-being. So if we love God with all of our heart, we love our neighbor as ourselves, we're going with the grain of the universe that is love. But if we say, you know, I, I don't want to love God. I don't, I'm not into that. I would rather just maybe like love myself. And I don't want to love my neighbor. I just want to use my neighbor to get ahead in life. Well, then we start going against the grain of the universe, and we begin to suffer the shards and splinters of self-inflicted suffering. Now, we can call this the wrath of God, and the Bible does, but it doesn't mean that God's attitude is one of retribution. But sometimes the metaphor uh, tends to overshadow some of that deeper theology. I admit that that's the case, probably, in both First and Second Thessalonians, where the, where the metaphor probably tends to overshadow some of the richer Pauline theology that you'll get in Ephesians, Colossians, sure. Corinthians, places like that. I think what you're, I think what's, what you're saying is spot on. Uh, in the parables, when you read about they're, they're turned over to the torturers or they go to everlasting mm -hmm. fire or something like that, and you keep in mind that the whole thing is a parable, you know right. what he's saying is like in the parable of the uh, the forgiving king in Matthew eighteen, when that servant goes out and he doesn't forgive his fellow servant, right. he's delivered to the torturers, and we all know what that's like when you hold a grudge, or like in, yeah, he he has that within his own heart, right? Or when you or, I mean, or the, in, the, in in Matthew the, the parable makes it external so we can see it. Yeah, exactly. But but Jesus is actually just showing what's going on inside of a forgiven sinner who refuses to forgive his brother. Exactly. And I think that's what you have in the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, in the parable of the talents. You know, what happens if you your view of God is he's this vengeful thing that so that reaps where he does not so of course you're gonna hide your talent, you know? Yeah. So when you look at Second Thessalonians one with with that in mind, without allowing our culture to help us interpret that passage and instead allow the teaching and person of Jesus to help us interpret that passage. And you begin at verse one instead of at verse eight or whatever, you start to see 
he, he's talking about this intense pressure, this, this uh, persecution, this thalipsis that they're enduring. And then mm -hmm. he says that what they're doing to you is going to happen to them. And you recall what Jesus said in Luke 19, if you, if you had known the way of peace, right? But, yep. but since you haven't, it's been hidden from your eyes and your enemies yep. are going to surround you. You know, the, the source of the persecution in First and Second Thessalonians, uh, when you read Acts 17, were those uh, Jewish people in the synagogue that were chasing people from, from city to city uh, there in Acts 17. And that path of violence that they chose ended up its ultimate, ultimate manifestation in the, uh, the zealots rebelling against Rome and, and uh, the fall of Jerusalem that led to the yeah, fall of Jerusalem. So, so for example, the Olivet Discourse in Luke's account, Right. Yeah. In Luke 21, it, it speaks of, for these are days of vengeance. Yeah, that's but it's where I was not, going. But it's yeah. not divine vengeance. It's Roman vengeance that they've pulled down upon their own heads and that Jesus repeatedly warned them against. With tears in his eyes as he With did it. With tears in his eyes, weeping over the city and saying, don't weep for me to the women, you know, <laughs> as he's on his way to the cross. Yeah. Weep for you because if they do this to the green tree. He said, I'm not advocating violent revolution, but your sons will. And if they do this in the green, what are they going to do in the dry? Or, or that, or that um, interesting episode in Luke 13 where they come to Jesus and they say, hey, uh, did you hear about uh, those Passover pilgrims that they came to offer their sacrifice and apparently they probably got involved in a – some sort of protest, uh, you know, a revolt at the temple, and and they got killed, yeah, uh, by Pilate's, uh, by the Praetorian Guard there, not the Praetorian Guard, the the guard in the Antonia Fortress, uh, and poetically would say that Pilate mingled their blood with their sacrifices, and Jesus, said, yeah, do, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the rest of Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you rethink everything, you're going to die in the same way. Yep. And then Jesus adds, and what about the Tower of Siloam? Yeah. That it collapsed and it killed 18 people. Do you think everyone is that they were worse sinners than everybody? No. Unless you rethink, you're all going to perish in the same way. So what he's we hear that about like an afterlife judgment. No. Jesus right. is saying this. Unless you rethink, you're hell bent for rebellion against Rome. You're all going to die by Roman swords and falling, collapsing buildings which is exactly what happened in AD 70. Yeah, ex exactly. And so when we're reading like first and second Thessalonians or any of these passages, uh, you know, that Paul is drawing from this old Testament imagery of Jesus coming in the clouds with a, you know, sword or flaming fire or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's, it's usually about to my, my, from my perspective, national judgment or something like that. And yeah. so it's not so much about which God. is what happened. Yeah. You know. It's not so much that Jesus is, you know, up there cheering on Titus as, you know, women are having to kill their own children for food in the Jerusalem walls. It's, it's about, this is what happened when a group of people who God desperately loved chose the path of violence over and over yeah. and over again. And yeah, I can as, tell you've read some of Josephus and his account yeah, of the yeah. siege and destruction of Jerusalem is just horrifying. It's terrible. It's horrifying. It's terrible. And it, it, the only words that eventually are left to you is it was hell. Which is probably and what Jesus meant. Well, it's exactly <laughs> when Jesus yeah. is most of the time when Jesus is talking about Gehenna. Yeah. He's talking about what is impending. Yeah. That's why That's why in the Olivet Discourse, he says, this generation shall not pass away until all of these things are fulfilled. And indeed, right. within 40 years, all the things that Jesus had warned about came to pass. Yeah, and, and I think that's what we have going on in Revelation too, uh, because I know that you, you mentioned in your book that you take a later date on Revelation, but you see it as sort of a commentary on what was going on between right. the two cities, one city being... Uh, yeah. One city being the city of God, the New Jerusalem, and the other city perhaps being the Old Jerusalem that chose this path of violence against the biggest superpower in the world at that time, you know. And so the end result of that, you know, being, as you mentioned, hell, to, so to speak. And so uh, I take a similar position to you on Revelation. I, I, f I favor an earlier date myself, but as same difference pretty much in terms of how how to sort right. of look at the book we we arrive at the same place whether it was penned in the 60s or in the 90s but yeah yeah and and I would, so it's it's, a, it's really a matter whether the whether the writer of revelation is being truly predictive or providing a prophetic interpretation looking back 
20 years. Sure. And even predictive. Or looking ahead, whatever, 10 years or whatever. And even predictive may not be predictive in the sense of fortune telling. It could be predictive in the sense of exactly. e examining the political and social landscape using the teaching of Jesus. If you pick up the sword, you'll die by the sword and saying in a very dramatic way, this is what's going to play out, you know. And so I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, regardless of what way. But the point is, is that it's not a, it's not a book about, hey, this is the, these are the things that God is doing to people uh, to punish them for their sins this is the path that they chose by following the way of uh yeah the Armageddon. wrath of god is consequential not retributive right, not that. punitive that's by consequential i mean it is the result of our it's the consequences we are more punished by our sins than for our sins right i mean sin carries its own punishment inherently with it the truth is no one ever gets away with anything now you may <laughs> think they do yeah. But ultimately, no one gets away with anything. Right. Sin carries inherently within it its own punishment. Yeah, and the only freedom that there is is you know is is through Christ and being let go, right. you know, being let go from right. that. The truth will yes. make you free, and that's not an abstract list of propositions. It's a person, Jesus. He sets us free from that guilt and from that. Uh, well, that let's yeah. look at that. That John eight passage: the truth will set you free. Yeah. yeah, and we kind of just throw it out there in a real abstract way and put it on libraries, and that's fine. But, but what's going on is you have these Judean would-be disciples, and they're 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 wanting to become disciples of Jesus. Jesus' disciples come from Galilee, but this is a, a Jerusalem episode. Yeah, and Jesus, well, that's great, but if you abide in my word, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Right. And they said, well, we're sons of Abraham. We're free. We've never been enslaved. You know, we're free. And she says, yeah, you're really not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're really not. In fact, you are enslaved by um, your willingness to kill. Collective killing is the theme that runs through John 8. It starts with the attempted stoning of the woman caught in adultery, and it ends with an attempted stoning of Jesus at the end. And Jesus says, uh, you no, know, you're really not of your father, Abraham. You're really of your father, the devil, because the, the devil was a murderer from the beginning, and you are seeking to kill me. And at first they say, you're crazy. You're crazy. You got a demon. Nobody's trying to kill you. And before the chapter's out, they're trying to kill him. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> but, he, but at one point he says, if you were children of Abraham, you would do what Abraham did. What did Abraham do? Well, Abraham did lots of things. But what did Abraham do in the realm of religious motivated killing? He put down the sword. I put down the knife. So that if Abraham is the father of monotheism, he's also the father of the abolition of human sacrifice. See, we, we read the uh, Genesis 22, the sacrifice of Isaac, as Christians call it, better to call it the akidah, the binding of Isaac, like the Jews do, because it wasn't a sacrifice. It was... He wasn't sacrificed. Um, the, the dominant rabbinic interpretation of that passage is this is where Abraham receives the revelation that God doesn't want human sacrifice. Yeah. We read it very in a very uh, anonic, an, anachronistic way where we think, oh, you know, how in the world, you know, sacrifice your son? How could that? I mean, it is horrible, but it wasn't unheard of, especially in the ancient Near East and the Canaanite world. This thing happened. You sacrifice the firstborn to ensure future futility. And, but Abraham realized this isn't what God wants. And so the truth will set you free when you realize that God does not sanction or want any killing for religious purposes. He just doesn't. And that's really the context of what Jesus is talking about there. That's, wow. a, that's a very interesting passage, John 8. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I'll have to revisit this one after the podcast. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's always good to reread those kinds of passages after you have conversations like this, mm -hmm. you know, because of the new insights that you gain. And that's, that's, again, this is all about interpreting Bible and community. That's what we're trying to do here. Um, Brian, is there anything else that you want to throw out there? In, you said you want to head somebody off when it came to Isaiah 53. Is there any other passages that you want to, Throw out there to well, examine, quickly you know. I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm not here to sell the book. You know, it came out in 2017, sure. but <laughs> I would just say read the book because you know, yeah. I, what I really want to deal with, it's in the book. Um, I don't know what else to say. Hey, that sounds great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a class on this book. You know, this book is kind of habit. It's been out for a while, and yeah, 
but it it continues to have some staying power. Sure. Uh, I haven't said this to anybody. I mean, I've talked about it with our team, but nobody knows this. I don't even remember the dates, but sometime later this year, I'm going to do like a, I think it's a five or six week class on it online, you know, be online. That's awesome. Uh, Um, You you are the first person. I mean, my church doesn't know I'm doing this. (laughs) Hey, there we go. So (laughs) that's really cool. I can't even remember. I think it's in, I don't remember. I think it, it might be in June. Oh, cool. But, well, see, the, but last, it, the last person. Oh, we have the dates. I just don't remember what they are. But if you if you kind of pay attention to me, I'll get you the word. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I, I like to watch your uh, sermons when they come out on YouTube. And so I'll point our audience to that as well. Now, the last person who came on and said they had a class uh, coming out, it was filled up before the podcast even published. And so hopefully this yeah. one will get out there before. <laughs> but I appreciate you giving us the heads up on that. And just to let you know, uh, I've seen this book. It's been talked about a lot, and a lot of the sort of Church of Christ groups I'm a part of on Facebook that are sort of rethinking things and revisiting some old ideas, it's it's been brought up a lot. And for our listeners, in case they didn't know this, um, one of our founders in the Churches of Christ, even though we hate to use that (laughs) terminology because we of course were the one true church established in 8033 by Jesus himself. Um, Barton W. Stone, like Brian here, uh, denied penal substitutionary atonement. And if you want some more uh, resources on that for our listeners, I know that uh, you can look at the Christian Messenger. Uh, Some of his very first articles in there were about that distinction. And him and Alexander Campbell continued to work together in fellowship for years and years and years, and his and his uh, disciples and Alexander Campbell's disciples, so to speak, worked together for years. And so, just because you have a different opinion on the atonement than someone else, doesn't mean that they are apostate or something. You can still get along and still be still be friends. Amen. So, Amen. Well, Brian, thank you so much for. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful we could have theological disagreements and still love one another and be kind and respectful? <laughs> that would be that'd be something. I'd almost call that Christian. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh man, it's 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 a lot of fun. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to uh, just continuing to watch your ministry and uh, read after you, and I hope that our listeners will join in on that too. And uh, and if you want to join in on the discussion about this podcast, then feel free to join our Facebook group for Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace. Hope you all all have a great day, Brian. Again, thanks so much for coming. Thank on. Thank you, Rod. Y'all have a great day, and uh, God bless.